have our courts been confronted by so polemical, elastic, and indeterminate notion as the so-called basic structure uh, doctrine. And, and, and it all began with uh, when a group of distinguished uh, citizens aggrieved by what they perceived was an imminent overthrow of the Constitution, approached the court, the High Court in particular, uh, seeking its intervention uh, to stop uh, that overthrow. And I've also, like my colleagues, addressed uh, the origin of now what is being called the basic structure uh, doctrine, and I don't think I need to go into uh, the stages, the historical stages uh, of how this uh, notion, in my view, uh, sprouted and continues uh, 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 sprouting in parts of uh, the world. Uh, I think that uh, my colleagues who have spoken have done a sterling job, and I do not intend to retrace the history of this uh, uh, doctrine. But I do ask, how did we find ourselves enmeshed in this kind of uh, theorizing? Because right from the High Court, and now up to this court, what we appear to be doing when addressing this notion of the basic structure of the Constitution is really a preserve of uh, legal and social science scholars. It is hardly uh, an occupation of a court of law, not to mention an apex court of law uh, uh, like this one. So how did we find ourselves in this uh, 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 process? It's because there can be no doubt uh, that in approaching the court, the petitioners had been aggrieved by what they perceived as an imminent threat to the Constitution posed by this amendment bill. But instead, uh, what they should have done, in my view, they would have, been, they would have laid down a prayer in which the alleged uh, the fear of violation of the Constitution and in support thereof, they were at liberty to deploy uh, any arguments, propositions, and analytic tools to convince the court that indeed uh, such a declaration was warranted. But instead, what we have here is a fundamental departure from a long established uh, uh, tradition of invoking the jurisdiction of the High Court. Uh, the petitioners instead presented the court with a theoretical construct, uh, a fait accompli, whose declaratory validation uh, they sought. And unfortunately, the High Court elevated this proposition uh, as designed by the petitioners into an issue for determination, even at a preliminary level. And later they would be joined by our colleagues at the High Court. But be that as it may, now that the applicability of the basic structure and doctrine in courts has nobled into a ubiquitous inquiry, we at the Supreme Court may not, without stirring justified indignation, disregard it altogether. And so, I have been compelled, uh, just as my colleagues have been, to go into uh, an exegesis of what then is the anatomy of this basic structure uh, doctrine. I have asked myself whether indeed it is a doctrine, juristically uh, speaking. I have come to the conclusion after not just a soul searching, but serious uh, uh, thoughts that what we are faced with as a basic structure doctrine is no such uh, doctrine. Instead, it is what I consider as a school of thought, uh, uh, or at best, 
a heuristic device which a court of law, when faced with the question as to whether uh, a proposed constitutional amendment is of such a nature as to destroy, destabilize, or distort the constitutive authority of the Constitution, a court of law faced with such kind of question can deploy this heuristic uh, device uh, in its effort to answer the question. But I find no fault with this rich and diverse array of opinions, so eruditely crafted uh, by some of our finest in the judicial system, the legal profession, academic institutions, and from far afield by way of Amici Curie. And indeed, uh, we who are called upon to adjudicate upon the affairs of men and women in their relations with one another and between them and the state are all the more privileged when served from such uh, a tantalizing menu of ideas uh, by the bar and the bench. Yet my discomfiture, ladies and gentlemen, with the manner in which this issue was brought before the High Court in the first instance still persists. And it bears repeating that in the ordinary scheme of things, a petitioner ought to approach the courts seeking relief on the basis of a real or perceived violation of the Constitution. But to begin by seeking a declaration there exists, that there exists somewhere in our psyche, beyond and above the Constitution, a doctrine that is nonetheless applicable in our legal system and which we have to take cognizance of even as we embark upon the determination of whether certain actions or omissions have violated the Constitution is to lead judges onto a terrain uh, hitherto uncharted. Uh, it is my firm view that this prolonged debate has been agonizingly stripped of the discipline of judicial inquiry, uh, first through what I consider to be the conceptual profligacy of elevating a notion to a legal doctrine and embellishing it with an extra constitutional force of law, and then quite inexplicably attempting to locate the minted doctrine into the text of our constitution. So on the one hand, uh, we are treated to what I can call lyrics of contextualism, while on the other we are strung with thuds of textualism. And so the orchestra, in my view, goes on, which, if not choreographed, could unleash an interpretative odyssey, or maelstrom, if you like, attempts to wriggle therefrom by those to come after us, which could end up in theatrical ignominy. All this while, scant attention has been paid to what I consider a majestic directive principle in our Constitution, a tool of analysis that faced with such questions as the ones I have posed, a court of law must deploy. And I make reference to Article 259 of the Constitution, the marginal knot of which reads construing the Constitution, or construing this Constitution. And instructively, this provision is preceded by another, uh, which I consider as a defensive armor gifted to our vigilantes of democracy and the rule of law. And this is at call 258.1. And so I go on and on that by the end of the day, in answer to the issue as so formulated, I arrive at a conclusion to the effect that the so-called basic structure doctrine is not applicable uh, in Kenya. I go on uh, to consider uh, the extent if it is so applicable. But having arrived at that conclusion, I then uh, limit myself to some of the statements and pronouncements that were made by the two superior courts, that is to say, uh, the High Court uh, and Court of Appeal. In this process, I arrive at a conclusion that contrary to what was uh, decided in error, if you ask me, 
There is no con provision in our constitution that is unamendable. The question for us to ask is whether the constitution of 2010 has within it comprehensive provisions, directive principles, and normative prescriptions which are capable of withstanding any efforts from whichever quarter of abrogating it, distorting it, or fundamentally changing its equilibrium. That is the question that we should ask. And when I asked that question, I arrived at an answer in the affirmative. So that leads me to the next issue, whether the president can initiate changes or amendments to the constitution, and whether the constitutional amendment can only be initiated by parliament through the parliamentary initiative uh, in agreement uh, with uh, my colleagues at the High Court and Court of Appeal, I am of a firm opinion, having read uh, the relevant provisions regarding that issue, and in context, I am of the opinion uh, that the President cannot initiate uh, what is re referred to as a popular initiative under Article 255 and Article 257 of the Constitution because those articles talk about an initiative to amend the Constitution by the people. And the word people here is not an ornamental one. It is a serious expression of what forms what we consider a social uh, contract. And both the High Court and Court of Appeal held that such an initiative is reserved for what they call the, uh, the common uh, mananchi. But before uh, answering this uh, uh, question, I had to ask myself as to what really constitutes uh, a popular uh, initiative. In my view, a proposal to amend the Constitution through a popular initiative comes into being when there is a felt need uh, for such an amendment by the people. Uh, but care must be, however, taken, as advised by Professor Migai Akech in his amicus brief, not to anjikunize, no, but that's my, my expression, not to anjikunize every stage of constitution making or amendment uh, in his comprehensive analysis of the history of the constitution making in Kenya, the good professor, rightly in my opinion, decries the tendency to underestimate the role by what played, by what he calls the political elite in the making of the constitution of 2010. And why do I agree with him? Because in my view, a democratic polity such as ours comprises of a complex mix of the ordinary, the elite, and the philosopher, each of whom is entitled to meaningfully participate in the popular initiative of constitutional amendment. Therefore, this felt need to amend the constitution may find expression in various fora, such as our institutions of higher learning, public symposia organized by civil society, religious and community-based organizations, if you remember the Ufungumano Caucasus, and even public rallies, as long as those rallies are uh, not organized under the influence of the political class, especially the elected one. And these symposia and caucuses and rallies would have as their main objective the need to firstly clarify the rationale and content of the proposal for amendment, and secondly to sensitize the general public and harness their support for such a proposal. At the end of the day, this felt need will have undergone such repetition, such notoriety, such refinement, and would have acquired 
such stability and coherence as to be capable of being formulated into a general suggestion or bill as stipulated in Article 2572 of the Constitution. At no stage, it's very clear to me, is the role of the president, qua president, contemplated by the provisions of that article. It cannot have been lost on a casual observer of our painful history that it was the imperial presidency that mutilated the independence constitution through unchecked amendments to such an extent that at the end of the day, this country had lost any pretensions to democracy, rule of law, human rights, or social justice. And by the early 1990s, the Kenyan people were terrified, tormented, and dehumanized a lot, deprived of any sense of self-actualization in the manner in which they were governed. It was from such despondency that the people would rise to demand a new social contract, a new order that would not only restore their dignity, but also present the executive, uh, prevent the executive arm of government, if you like, read the president, and to a certain extent the legislature, from reversing the new equilibrium, from taking them from the paradigm shift to which they had cutted uh, themselves. And so to this question, I have no hesitation in holding that the president cannot initiate a popular initiative. That takes me quite quickly as to whether indeed uh, the president did initiate uh, this popular uh, initiative. Uh, it's on record via the Gazette notice number 514 dated 24th May 2018 that the president appointed a task force named Building Bridges to United Kenya Task Force or the BBA task force, if you like. Uh, the, this task force was composed of eminent Kenyans whose mandate it was to address the nine key challenges facing the country. And these challenges have been identified in a memo of understanding signed between uh, the President and Right Honorable Raila Odinga. Thereafter, the President, Vide Gazette Notice Number 264, published on 10th January 2020, appointed a steering committee on the implementation of the Building Bridges to United Kenya Task Force report. One of the terms of reference of that steering committee was to propose administrative policy, statutory, and constitutional changes that may be necessary for the implementation of the recommendations contained in the task force report. It is out of which the steering committee that uh, we now have uh, the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill of 2020. I, on my part, find, although the High Court later described the task force as an unconstitutional outfit, I, on my part, find that there was nothing unconstitutional in the appointment or composition of either the task force or the steering committee by the president. Uh, what remains is whether the president can be regarded as having initiated the process uh, that culminated into uh, the bill that we now have. And in conclusion, I have stated that taking everything into consideration, all the stages, all the processes that led uh, to the bill, uh, I find it uh, difficult to distance the president from the involvement and the initiation of uh, the popular initiative. Therefore, I find that uh, the president did actually originate this uh, initiative. The conclusion deriving from this, I shall return to in my final conclusions. And now, next is whether the second schedule to the Constitution Amendment Bill 2020 is unconstitutional. Uh, both the High Court and Court of Appeal found that schedule unconstitutional. I have considered 
the reasoning by the two superior courts. I have looked at the relevant law and I come to a similar conclusion uh, that uh, this second schedule to the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2010-2020 is actually unconstitutional. Fourth, I consider whether civil proceedings can be instituted against the president in person or a person performing the functions of the office of the president during his tenure of office. And I know I've taken into cognizance the submissions by the Attorney General urging the court to find that such proceedings cannot be instituted uh, against the president or a person performing the functions of that uh, office. I also know that there are those who have strenuously uh, opposed the Attorney General's submissions and have argued that such immunity is limited, so limited that the President can on occasion be sued where or if he violates the Constitution and if he violates any other law when he is not acting in his capacity as the President. And I have, having carefully considered those arguments, I find considerable difficulty in appreciating the rationale or basis upon which first the High Court found that notwithstanding the clear and unambiguous language in Article 1432 of the Constitution, that the President can still be sued in his personal capacity for acts or omissions alleged to be in violation of the Constitution. Why did the High Court introduce the phrase only protected? And then turning uh, to the finding by the Court of Appeal, I find similar uh, difficulty because it is clear that should the President engage in an act or omission that is violative of the Constitution, there are constitutionally recognized uh, pathways through which such violation can be put uh, right. And I have mentioned and discussed them in the body of my judgment. But a more profound legal reason for presidential immunity in both its private and official capacity is to be found in Article 1433 of the Constitution, which provides that where provision is made in law limiting the time within which proceedings under at Clause 1 or 2 may be brought against a person, a period of time during which person the person holds or performs the functions of the president shall not be taken into account in calculating the period of time prescribed by that law. And what is this law referring to? It must be referring to the law of limitations. And then why would the president be denied the benefit of limitation of actions precisely because the president cannot be sued in his private capacity during the tenure of his or her office. And I also state that once a president, always a president, until he or she vacates the office, because you cannot be a president today and tomorrow you are not a president so that you may be so sued. That brings me to issue number five, the place of public participation under Article 10 vis-a-vis the role of IBC and whether there was public participation. And in response to this, after a uh, serious uh, analysis, I find uh, that there was no obligation on the part of the IBC at the time it embarked upon the verification of signatures to satisfy itself as to whether there had been public uh, participation before the bill and signatures were transmitted to it. I do not find anything in the Constitution that obliges the IBC uh, to carry out that function. But what about the promoters of uh, the, popular the popular initiatives? What about uh, Dennis Waweru, Mr. Waweru, Honorable, Honorable Junette 
who have defined themselves as promoters, were they not supposed to undertake uh, meaningful public participation? The argument that I see here, again, in such a proposal, is that the process begins, the process of popular initiative begins with the collection of signatures. And I do not uh, agree with that proposition because before you collect signatures, there must be something you are offering the people. You are taking to the people either that general suggestion or a draft bill. And if you are seeking their signatures, surely the people must understand the contents of the bill to which they are appending their signatures. I have read the contents of the affidavit sworn by Honorable Waweru, uh, the contents of which state that there was a comprehensive and robust process of uh, uh, consultation. But the contents of that robust consultation are not uh, clearly stated. And so I'm concluding that when it comes to the promoters of the popular initiative, I do not myself think that they undertook sufficient or meaningful public participation under, uh, within the meaning of Article 10 of the Constitution of 2010. And now this brings me to the interpretation of Articles 8, 8 and 250 of the Constitution with respect to the composition and quorum of the IABC. This one has been thrust to us because somewhere along the line, it, the petitioners did allege that at the time it undertook the verification of signatures, the IABC lacked the requisite quorum uh, to be able to constitutionally undertake uh, that task. And then I have also looked at uh, the history of uh, the, legisla the, the legislative form that prescribes the quorum of IABC. I've looked at the contents of the at Article 251 of the Constitution, and I come to this conclusion, that if, as indeed we must conclude, that at the time the IABC undertook the verification of signatures, it was constitutionally and properly so uh, constituted, how on earth can we then say that it lacked quorum? to undertake the tasks for which it was properly constituted. And then my attention has been drawn to the contents of uh, paragraph 5 of Schedule uh, 12, I think, to the IABC Act, which sets uh, that quorum at 5. And I'm simply saying that as between a constitutional provision, you cannot use uh, the provisions of a statute to override the majesty of a constitutional provision. And having so said, I find that the IBC had the requisite quorum to conduct the verification of signatures and any other task that the Constitution requires it to, to undertake. And finally, I come to this vexed question of whether uh, the interpretation of 25710 of the Constitution entails that all, or requires, that all specific proposed amendments of the Constitution should be submitted as separate and distinct referendum questions. I had no difficulty in uh, disposing of this particular issue because it was not right, as rightly observed by my colleague uh, Tuyot J.A. of the Supreme Court, and I'm not the kind of person to engage in abstract exercises. Because if we did that, then we would be also encouraging Kenyans, as indeed they have done to us in this basic structure uh, in Broglio, uh, to come with abstract questions and expect us to expend valuable judicial time disentangling uh, the same. So what are my conclusions? One, the basic structure doctrine is not applicable in Kenya in the way and manner in which it has been formulated. Because it's no such doctrine, neither does it have a force of law 
juridically so understood. I've said it is a heuristic device. The four sequential steps of civic education, public participation, and the rest are not also applicable to the process of constitutional amendment envisaged under Articles 255, 256, and 257. Such steps, uh, and not necessarily in that order, would become operative in the event of a seismic constitutional moment which dictates that the people must exercise their primary constituent power to make a new constitution or re-establish the constitutional order. And three, the president cannot initiate or activate any constitutional changes through a popular initiative process as envisaged under articles 255 and 257 of the constitution. And four, uh, the president actually did uh, initiate uh, the proposed constitutional uh, amendments and the effect of that, I believe, should be able to come out in the final disposition of this uh, dispute by this court. Uh, the second schedule to the Constitution of Kenya, Amendment Bill 2020, is unconstitutional. Civil proceedings cannot be brought or instituted in any court of law against the President or a person performing the functions of that office in their personal capacity during their tenure of office in respect of anything done or not done in the exercise of their powers under the Constitution. And seven, the IABC is not under any obligation to ensure that the promoters of a popular initiative have facilitated public participation before transmitting the resultant bill uh, to it. But I also say that in this particular instance, no meaningful public participation was conducted by the promoters of this bill. Nine, the IABC had the requisite quorum at the time it undertook and completed the verification of signatures. And finally, the interpretation of Article 25710 in the manner in which the issue has been formulated is not right for consideration, not just by this court, by any other court in this country. Uh, before I sign off, my mind races back to those three days in this tent uh, during which I and my colleagues here sat patiently, pensively and attentively listening to the impassioned pleas from the bar so commandingly assembled not that this was the first time I was finding myself having to endure the perorations of counsel. Some of them experienced jurists and others not so senior. But it was such a moment when the basics of a basic structure were basically spewed unto us with such a plumb hitherto unseen, save during the hearing of a presidential election petition. Uh, what we were told, however, uh, I, I, I also uh, remember that it was on such occasion that we were reminded that our colleagues at the High Court and Court of Appeal, the colleagues at the High Court had built a foundation, and those ones at the Court of Appeal had constructed a wall upon it, and that now it was our turn to paint uh, that wall but we were not told with which colors we were to undertake this alluring task. I also remember being urged to roar, you know, roar like lions in the wild, as we asserted the supremacy of the Constitution. Uh, but who could fault counsel for invoking our hallowed symbol of nationhood? Yet, at that moment, I could not help but cringe for the sound of a roar of a lion in the wild uh, stirred in me images of a terrifying, the terrifying language so beloved by our politicians, the language of tsunamis, of earthquakes, volcanoes, war and thunder. And that is why I cringed. 
And then I remembered that not so long ago, this court had in one of its judgments, and really in true oracular rendition, or so I thought, decreed as follows. But it does appear, as my colleague, Judge Lenaola here apprehended, counsel do not read the judgments of this court. And now I am forced to read this decree to you so that even if you don't read it, it shall be act in your mind. And this is what this court said at that time. What was the argument that this court should not subvert the will of the people? This court is one of those to whom that sovereign power has been delegated under Article 13C of the same constitution. All its powers, including that of invalidating the presidential election, is not self-given nor forcefully taken, but is donated by the people of Kenya to dishonestly exercise that delegated power and to close our eyes to constitutional violations would be a dereliction of duty, and we refuse to accept the invitation to do so, however popular that invitation may seem. Therefore, however burdensome, let the majesty of the Constitution reverberate across the lengths and breadths of our motherland. Uh, let it bubble from our rivers and oceans. Let it boomerang from our hills and mountains. Let it serenade our households from the trees. Let it sprout from our institutions of learning. Let it toll from our sanctums of prayer. And to those who bear the responsibility of leadership, let it be a constant irritant. So I say no more. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much, Justice Wanjara, for that rendition. I now request the Honorable Mr. Justice Ibrahim Mohammed to deliver his opinion.